I think the fear is if we commit and if we're monogamous, we'll lose desire. The reality is if we commit and if we're monogamous, sexual desire is something we have to actively cultivate in the space between us. And we cultivate it in the space between us by understanding our own internal sexual erotic self. What do I need? What helps me feel open to sexual connection? What, what reminds me? What are the cues? That, how can I help myself remember that sex feels good, that I deserve pleasure, that we will feel more connected if we do? I'm Olivia Clementine, and this is Love and Liberation. Today, our guest is Dr. Alexandra Solomon. Dr. Solomon is a clinical assistant professor in the Department of Psychology at Northwestern University and a licensed clinical psychologist at the Family Institute at Northwestern University. In addition to writing articles and chapters for leading academic journals and books in the field of marriage and family, she is the author of the book, Loving Bravely, 20 Lessons of Self-Discovery to Help You Get the Love You Want. Her second book about sexual self-awareness, Taking Sexy Back, How to Own Your Sexuality and Create the Relationship You Want, just landed on Sunday, so it's available now, and this is what we'll talk about today. Dr. Solomon maintains a psychotherapy practice for individual adults and couples, teaches and trains marriage and family therapy graduate students, and teaches the internationally renowned undergraduate course, Building Loving and Lasting Relationships, Marriage 101. Dr. Solomon is a highly sought after speaker who works with groups like United States Military Academy at West Point, Microsoft, and the American Association of Marriage and Family Therapy. And she is frequently asked to talk about love, sex, and marriage with media outlets like the Today Show, O Magazine, The Atlantic, Vogue, and Scientific American. I'm really happy to have Dr. Solomon here today. And when I reviewed the conversation I had with her, I realized I actually never really introduced the book in our conversation. So I want to do that right now. And the book, once again, is Taking Sexy Back. So anytime we talk about it, just know that that's the book we're speaking about. And the link, if you want to check out the book, will be in the show notes. Highly recommend it. And really looking forward to you hearing everything that Dr. Solomon has to share today. So we'll just jump right in. Talk a bit about this tension that we need to maintain between rigidity and chaos, this place that you live in where a relationship thrives. Can you talk about those two things, this tension and, and how we can nurture it in a relationship? What you are talking about is this idea I present around and it's something that's, that's based on the work of Dan Siegel. So Dr. Dan Siegel, his work is at the intersection of like Buddhist mindfulness and neuropsychiatric understanding of the brain and then relationship, right? So he's one of the sort of founding thought leaders in the world of interpersonal neurobiology. And so what he did was at some point, maybe 20 years ago at this point, he started opening up our diagnostic manual, the manual that clinicians use to, to diagnose disorders. And he opened it up to just random pages. And what he realized is you could take any emotional mental health disorder and put it as put it under a large heading of either a disorder of rigidity or a disorder of chaos. So when we think about anorexia nervosa, it's a disorder of rigidity, right? Rigid rules around what foods are okay, what foods aren't okay, when I can eat, when I can't eat. So it's a disorder of restriction, tightening up, and narrowness. When we think about a disorder like bipolar disorder, that tends to be more of a disorder of chaos. Sometimes I'm manic and sometimes I'm depressed and there's sort of these large sorts of swings and a sense of internal chaos. And so that, that took him to this place of thinking about all of well-being and internal well-being, relational well-being, cultural well-being as, as not getting locked down in either a place of rigidity nor having the wheels come totally off and being in a place of chaos. And so our intimate relationships need some of both. They need to have um, predictability, that sense that I know you're going to be there for me and I know what's reasonable to expect from you, but not so much predictability, especially when we enter the bedroom, that it's like, 
oh yeah, uh-huh, we're gonna do that, and then we're gonna do that, and then we're gonna do, yeah, I know all your moves, you know all my moves. So the erotic certainly dislikes rigidity, but the erotic also doesn't like total chaos either, right? Because in order to be able to really express ourselves and get lost in a moment with a partner, we need to feel some base level of safety and security. Um, so, so that place of chaos, when we aren't able to kind of care for ourselves or be cared for by a partner, that's not a very safe place for the erotic to unfold. And so I really liked that way of inviting the reader to contemplate and explore where is their sexuality? Where does their sexual self live on that spectrum of rigidity to chaos? And then where does their relationship live on that spectrum from rigidity to chaos? Because this whole, the whole point of this, of this new book, of this Taking Sexy Back book, the whole point is that sex happens between partners, mostly. I mean, sex, there is solo sex, certainly. But our sex life mostly is an expression that happens between us and a partner, but it's foregrounded, it's, it's founded upon the relationship we have with our sexual self. And I think that just in the world we live in, there's just not a whole lot of space to explore what is my relationship with my sexual self. It's kind of like we're not worthy enough. We don't have, our, our time isn't worthy enough to really nurture our own experience of sexuality. In terms of safety and conflict, I know a lot of us resist conflict in our relationships. You know, we think something's wrong with our relationship. Talk about how conflict and this notion of commitment are really essential for us to have more experiences, erotic experiences, and meaningful experiences in partnership. Can you share a little bit about that, just even what that even looks like for us to have tools for conflict and, and making that something more central in our relationship, as well as this need for very clear ideas of our commitments in relationship? Yeah, I mean, I, when, I, when I think about the topic of conflict, I think the most important thing is that each of us has, I think we come into our relationship with particular beliefs about conflict. And, and we get our beliefs about conflict, first and foremost, primarily, from our original, like what I always call our original love classroom, which is our family growing up, right? So we, we, most of us grew up in a family system. And when we were growing up in that family system, we watched, we were like these little observers taking in all these little bits of data, you know, and we watched how the big people in our house dealt with disagreement, difference, not seeing things the same way, managing, uh, I need something, I need A, but you need B. And so we watched how that, like what happens in that space of friction, in that space of tension. And we watched people either sweep it under the rug, or we watched people yell and scream and use control maneuvers, or we watched people, you know, have really beautiful, I mean, some of us are really lucky and grew up in homes where they watch the big people relate to conflict as an intimacy generator, which it ultimately, like if we, as we do our inner work and as we do our relational work, that's what conflict becomes is a moment, like those moments of misunderstanding, then we can start to relate to them as a, a, a gateway or a possibility into new experiences of self and other. And we get there, we get there by framing it as it's not I'm right and you're wrong, or I'm wrong and you're right, but having a bit more of a shade of gray about there's truth in both of our positions and what we need to do is position ourselves shoulder to shoulder, you know, looking together at this tension or this issue. And it's certainly, my gosh, and conflict about sex, it's like conflict about sex is really painful because oftentimes we don't have great ways to talk about sex, even if we want to like share something really exciting and joyful and easy about sex, right? But certainly when there's disagreement or tension around sex, it's like a perfect storm because we don't have, we don't see, I don't know how many of us get to see really heartfelt, wholehearted conversation about sexuality. Certainly our sex education isn't generally like that. So it's like when disagreement and sex meet up together, it's like a, it's really hard to have ways of talking in heartfelt ways about how what I need sexually is different than what you need sexually, how our desires work differently, how, you know, those, those are challenging 
conversations to have. But again, every single sexual problem that a couple has is a couple problem. A simple example is desire discrepancy. You know, that's that sort of like the clinical term for it, which is that one of us wants sex more frequently than the other wants sex. And it's like, that's going to happen in a relationship. The chances that both people crave erotic connection at the exact same amount in the exact same way. Like the chances are, you know, slim to none that that's going to happen. So right there, that's a conflict. That's a tension. That's a, a moment of rub, you know? And so the frame has to be, how will we navigate this difference in our desire versus you are a nymphomaniac because you want sex all the time. No, you're frigid because you never want sex or I, something must be wrong with me. I must be broken, damaged, wrong because I either want too much sex or not enough sex. You know, those opportunities for shame and blame, they sink us. The moment our conversation is about shame and blame and right and wrong, we can't have an intimacy promoting conversation, you know? Oh, I love this so much. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I see this a lot, especially around the topic of premature ejaculation, if that's the term we want to use, it, right. where, you know, I'll see a couple and the man's experiencing this and he doesn't want to bring it to the forefront. So usually the, their partner will tell me. And then it's so hard to talk about it because he feels so much shame that he's not performing. And then she feels like she's not a good enough lover or something's wrong. Like everyone feels like something's wrong with them right. versus like, what else is going on here? What are all the facets of your life that are actually creating something that might not even be a problem? And mm -hmm. gosh, it's so, it actually really hurts my heart even just to feel into that the amount that we put each other down and really put ourselves down for not being good enough lovers of, of some kind. Yeah. Well, and even just, you know, think about the language there, premature ejaculation exactly. built into even yeah. the word choices, this idea that you're doing it wrong. It was too soon. Mm -hmm. And, and it is, I mean, this is, um, there are certainly a, a million challenges of living as a sexual minority, but one of the challenges of living as a heterosexual person or heterosexual couple is, is you enter the bedroom with these heavily loaded, gender locked in narrow sexual scripts um, that are highly erection focused and, um, and highly orgasm focused and, and very, you know, as sort of as think about like the bases, right? This idea we talked about in whatever middle school about first base and second base and third base and a home run. And so that penis and vagina intercourse has been held up as the most sex sex, right? Like sort of the end all be all versus like the, that man's erect penis is one instrument in a larger, you know, symphony that he has of his entire body and his entire ability to give and receive pleasure is so much bigger than that one part of his body. Yes. But my gosh, the whole, it's a, it's a massive setup from the moment the two of them enter the bedroom that what's the penis going to do today? Oh my Lord. I can only oh, imagine that that God. just sets the whole thing up. You know, yeah. well, I love your term intimacy generator, like just thinking about like conflict or even sexual, what, they, what seems like obstacles can actually generate intimacy if we flip it around and we're like, this can actually bring us together versus something that will, will break us apart. And I, I'd love to actually talk about gender roles and you do a really good job in your book trying to make it as inclusive. So it's not so focused on heterosexual couples. I really appreciate that. In terms of gender roles, what do you do if you're in a situation where one person's so bound to a gender role and the other person wants to open it up more? To me, the pain point is oftentimes our culture has shifted the story, separate and apart from whatever the heck the couple wanted, right? The, the data shows that 40% of homes are female breadwinner homes. And sometimes that's because there's only one adult, right? A single, a single parent. Um, a single mom is both the breadwinner and the caregiver. But a lot of times those, those, those are, that data is reflective of a straight couple where her ability to outperform, out earn him, that, that she just is out performing, out earning him in the workplace. And so it makes sense to put him in more of a caregiver role. But th that's oftentimes the pain point is it's really hard to subvert 10,000 years of patriarchal order. Even if the couple 
gets it and they understand it, oftentimes one or both of them has a member of their extended family who's sort of whispering in their ear, right? So maybe it's her mom who is whispering in her ear like, does he have a job yet? Is he going to get a job? And oh, you're just working so hard and you're doing so much. Or somebody's in his ear about, dude, you're, you know, she's a real ball buster. Like she's busting your ball, you know, whatever it is. So the couple then ends up getting undermined. And so that, that oftentimes becomes um, the pain point when in reality, a home, uh, you know, especially a home with adults and kids, it's a little system and there are different functions and different roles that need to be met. There does need to be somebody who is, who is gathering resources, who's earning money. That's an essential role to bring in something from the outside, but just as essential, like you can't, you can't eat a paycheck. So somebody has to convert the paycheck into food, into new shoes, into doctor's appointments. And so when we took, when we look at it that way, there is, there's zero value judgment on, they're just roles. They're just these roles that are completely interdependent and needed in order to make a system work in order to you know grow little people and keep everybody alive and well but what we've done as we always do is we've taken roles and we've said better worse we've said more powerful less powerful and we've said this role is for those this role is for men and this role is for women like we've we've done that and we've done it and we've watched it we've transmitted it generation to generation and we've put a lot of value your worth as a woman is about how your home looks and your worth as a man is about your paycheck. So it's hard to expand, but the modern world, like I think the, just the way the economics of the world looks, I mean, every, for every two diplomas that are given to men, there are three given to women. So there just is this, the balance is shifting and it's like our psychology needs to catch up. I feel like I didn't get concrete about like what to do about a couple where they want to expand the gender roles. I mean, I guess I went to the culture level because that is the first thing I do is just sort of name this is hard not because one or both of you are broken, damaged, doing it wrong. This is hard because what you are trying to do is subvert an entire way of being. That's what makes shifting gender roles or family roles difficult is that there oftentimes are these big cultural stories about how it quote unquote should be. Couple's journey is a story. I had an aha moment about this when I was sitting with a couple. They had been married, I don't know, 35 years? And the husband was asking for something knew it wasn't something sexual. It was about just a way they spend time. And he was wanting to embark on a really deep personal endeavor that, that was meaningful to him, but it was going to shake up the order of things in their marriage, you know? And she said to him, and it was so authentic. She said, this is not what I signed up for, you know? And that was like her deep truth in that moment was like, this isn't what I signed up for. And I just, my heart was really full of compassion for this idea that we come into a marriage or a relationship. There's all these like unconscious contracts that we've made, you know, about what we expect, who I need you to be, who I expect you to be. And, um, and then life gets in the way, right? Like we, we are, each of us as individuals is changing and evolving and what's meaningful to us when we're 25 is really different than what's meaningful for us at 45. And so the individuals are changing. And then by definition and the, the container, like the relationship is also changing. And when we have that moment of getting locked down, like this isn't what I signed up for. Can we be self-compassionate and self-aware enough to breathe into that and be like, okay, so that's some resistance. I'm resisting. Why am I resisting it? What's my fear? What does this, what's the story I'm telling myself? What's the old wound this connects to in me? That's the relationally self-aware way of meeting that moment. But our knee jerk way is just like, no, 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 please just take that off the table because, <laughs> because you putting it on the table is disrupting my equilibrium. And so just go back to being the way you were, please because I would be more comfortable. <laughs> exactly. It's an interesting thing just being a human because it's like the thing that would actually help us continue to experience life and, and connection, like this openness to something new or the openness to somebody else, like this desire for sameness can often just be the, the moments we choose to step out of a relationship or we choose to seek some other form of entertainment. 
if we take that all the way to infidelity, I think sometimes we get protective of our partners. We know that if, you know, we know that if we say, I'm feeling stale in this way, or I'm feeling stagnant in this way, especially around sex, we are afraid of hurting our partner because we, because oftentimes our partners take it personally. Like I'm a bad lover. I've let you down. I'm a disappointment. So I think sometimes when somebody cheats, it is in a weird way, an attempt to protect their partner. And just to say like, okay, if I can just scratch this itch over here or play this, play this need out over here, I won't have to upset the apple cart. I won't have to hurt my partner. Um, because we're so, especially around sexuality, I don't think we're ever taught that our sexuality is emerging and unfolding and dynamic and changing. And so we need to discover ourselves again and again. And then that means we need to, you know, recreate something with our partner again and again. And it's just hard. And so, so, and so if we can't bring it to the relationship and say, can we please expand the container of our relationship? to hold this new awareness I have about who I am or what I'm craving. That's hard to do. That's vulnerable to do. The stakes are high. And so I think that, I think oftentimes an affair is a reflection of this feels like in some ways the easier path, the less dangerous path. Talk a little bit about the exhaustion of the new way of being with the soul to soul connection, I think is what you call it. Do you have so many choices that could be overwhelming? And so, yeah, even when we are speaking of sexuality, it's like there's so many possibilities of how to engage with somebody. What do you think, even just for those people out there that are younger, just getting into the dating field or um, anyone feeling overwhelmed in terms Mm -hmm. of the relational field right now and all the possibility and all the choices, what, what do you, what would you say to them to support their sanity? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Yeah, that's in, in the book I write about relationships of transition from role to role arrangements to soul to soul arrangements. Role to role was based on what we we're saying earlier, these like very patriarchal notions that a man does this and a woman does this. And it always was framed in heterosexual language, of course, because we didn't have um, we didn't have the kind of inclusivity that we're moving towards now with gender expression and LGBT couples and, um, and gender minorities and sexual minorities of all, you know, in every way. So that patriarchal notion of men are X and they do Y, you know, and this is the purpose. And patriarchy, as uh, one of my favorite teachers, Terry Real, says that patriarchy was built for stability, not for intimacy. So tons of stability, right? The divorce rate was much lower when it was just sort of like, uh, you were just doing your job. And so there'd be really be no reason to look elsewhere. But now with the soul to soul connection, if we're going to make space for the soul, the soul is evolving and, and uh, dynamic. And so then the relationship needs to be, and it does, it requires more bandwidth, more ability to have um, conversation, more willingness to discover and rediscover and imagine and reimagine our partnership. And that's just harder. And I think sometimes we play it out Sometimes it comes out of like, um, I want something sexual that's new and different. And it gets kind of like locked into like, I need this behavior. I need this new sexual behavior to be worked into a repertoire. And maybe it is purely about a new behavior or just a curiosity, but it may just be a desire to just have a different experience of myself in the bedroom. You know, it may not be as much about like, I have to try this sex act that I haven't tried before versus it's just a kind of, a, a kind of energy I'm craving, the energy of transgression or the energy of novelty that can be met maybe with the same partner in a different way. We sometimes say it has to be a new partner when maybe it can be just the same partner with a different, a different context, a different story of what the sexual experience is going to be with each other. I mean, I love the idea of having many relationships with the same person, but really allowing it to completely unfold and be rebirthed. I guess kind of the benefit of that too, is it allows us obviously to embrace reality, like the ever changing field of existence, like things are not static. It helps us maybe also not take ourselves too seriously too. The longer I'm in this world, I'm just like, oh my gosh, I, you, can't, you can't take who you are too seriously. That's so much easier for me now, you know, in midlife than it was when I was younger. That's just not taking myself so seriously being really humble in the face of like, in some ways I'm wiser than I've ever been, but I'm also way more humble. Just, (laughs) I don't know. It's all really 
quite paradoxical and mysterious. So I think I just have a bit more comfort with not knowing and trusting unfolding than I used to. I would love to debunk the myth, the idea that if you're in a long-term couple, your sex life will deteriorate over time. And also just talk about the health of sex. Like it's not just, you know, what, what position can we do, but it actually is good for our well-being on many different levels. Yes. And the, the data does support that sexual desire for sure changes in an intimate relationship. And the, the demographic that seems to be potentially most at risk of having a real drop in sexual desire are straight women in long-term sexually monogamous relationships. And, and it's hard to know how much of it is a drop versus a shift because we have the traditional model of what sexual desire means is I feel it in my loin. So the definition of sexual desire has been horniness. Like I feel horny. I want sex. And the idea is that sexual experiences are driven by an interior physiological cue of I want to have sex. So then if you look at especially women, especially in long-term sexually monogamous relationships, that does taper off pretty quickly. But it's not the desire is gone, it's that it shifts and it goes from less spontaneous desire, so that's the, I feel it in my loins, to a more responsive desire. And responsive desire is the context somehow cues me that entering an erotic space with my partner would actually feel good. So it's not my body cueing me, it's this great conversation we had where I felt really heard and really seen, and that kind of becomes a natural segue then into a, into a physical expression of that connection. Or I wasn't feeling it, but then we watched this movie and there's a great sex scene in the movie, and that kind of triggered and reminded me that it would feel good. Or it's, I can tell my partner really wants to, and I know my body well enough that I know once we get started, I will be able to kind of ease in. So it's that, all this work, which I, the, the book I love around this is um, Dr. Emily Nagoski, Come As You Are. Beautiful guide, mostly written for those with a vulva around all of this stuff, around how much our mind, our body, our relational connection are all entwined. There is some new data now, um, Dr. Sarah Murray, has just published some data that shows that actually men experience this as well. I think that one of the challenges of being male in our culture is the story they've internalized is that you should always be ready. You should just have spontaneous desire and that you should always be ready. And what we're learning is if what she had, what she learned, Dr. Murray and her research is if you talk to men about this, men are also very relational in their sexual desire and they really want to be wanted and they really want to feel connected through sexuality. So I think the fear is if we commit and if we're monogamous, we'll lose desire. The reality is if we commit and if we're monogamous, sexual desire is something we have to actively cultivate in the space between us. And we cultivate it in the space between us by understanding our own internal sexual erotic self. What do I need? What helps me? What helps me feel open to sexual connection? What, what reminds me? What are the cues? That, how can I help myself remember that sex feels good, that I deserve pleasure, that we will feel more connected if we do? So that's really what it is. But I think certainly, I mean, I've been teaching college students and graduate students for, you know, two decades. And that is a question I've gotten so many times, like a deep, deep fear that, you know, what happens in a marriage? Like, does the sex go bad in a marriage? I think that is definitely a fear. And then what happens is, when desire changes, we are, as human beings, we are meaning-making creatures. So we experience a shift in our desire and we add meaning right away. And the meaning we're at risk of adding is, uh-oh, I must not love them anymore. Or we must be wrong for each other. Or we must be doomed. And then, of course, that takes on a life of its own and doesn't create space to have the conversation that a couple needs to have, which is what do we each need and want from ourselves and each other in order to continue to cultivate an erotic life together? In your book, when do you start to really follow the thread with somebody? You know, I'm thinking even of just the college students that you have. When is it a person that's worthy of your time to just like continue to go, go in deeper? 
when we think about hookup culture or um, ways in which young adults either want or feel pressured to separate um, sex from commitment. Mm -hmm. And there are certainly times when um, having sex without ha having sex outside of the context of commitment may be a really like just the perfect thing, right? Either you're coming out of a breakup, so you're not really ready to dive back in, or you're about to, you're traveling abroad, or you're about to travel abroad. Like there may be times when having um, a kind of, we're both agreeing that this is a strictly casual relationship, it may make total sense. What I struggle with um, and what I try to invite people to be reflective of is, is the why, like getting really clear and honest with yourself about the why. And what often happens is um, people ag agree to a no strings attached arrangement in the hopes that it will evolve into something else. And so there's a bit of self-abandonment, a bit or a lot sometimes, of self-abandonment in that, right? It's saying, I will open myself sexually um, in the hopes that, even though I don't really want to, even though I don't quite feel ready, in the hopes that it will evolve into something else. And I, um, it, talking about it in that way helps me get outside of judgment, because to me, it's not about judgment. I don't really particularly care what people do in their sex lives. What I care is, what I care about is how, is do you know when you're in your integrity? Do you know when you're making choices that really fit with the data of your gut, like what your gut is telling you, what your body is telling you? And are you making choices that are aligned with that versus are you doing things that feel like a big old should? Like I should be doing it this way. I should be able to have no strings attached sex or I have to have no strings attached sex in order to get this person to like me. Mm -hmm. That's a story. And that's a story that is then inviting you to self-abandon in a way that I worry then about, are you eroding the relationship between you and your erotic self? Because the erotic self doesn't lie really, right? The erotic self is just like, it wants what it wants. And so if, if we're putting ourselves in spots that don't where we aren't really kind of connected to our own desires and our own boundaries, we're kind of not paying attention to a pretty important part of who we are. In gratitude to our listeners and to support the making of this podcast, we wanted to let you know that you receive 10% off our shop of botanical offerings including tonics, teas, and skincare, as well as online relationship courses. So you can take a look under oliviaclementine.com and at checkout, use the code love and liberation for a discount. Thank you again for listening. If you enjoy our podcast, don't forget to leave a review or rating in iTunes. This helps other people find the podcast. And let's get back to today's wonderful conversation with Dr. Solomon. Narrating our sexual experiences is so important because especially if we grew up in a household that didn't talk about sex and or a religious community that was very shame loaded about sex, we don't, the thing we, we, we put sex in this sort of box off in the corner, right? And we don't, it doesn't tie the rest of life because it's bad, it's dirty, it's sinful, it's dangerous, it's wrong. So it has to go over there. So if I do have sex, I have to very quickly put it in that box and not look at it and not think about it and certainly not inquire or reflect or integrate or narrate or unpack the meanings of, right? Because you can't do that around something that's so shame loaded and bad and dirty. It has to just go sit in the box. I think so much of sexual healing then is about becoming aware of what did I learn? What are the messages I was given? And if those messages were that sex is bad and dirty and wrong and sinful, where do I want to go with that? And to me, one of the places to go is just to start to weave it into the story of who you are. I want to take a moment to talk about men these unhelpful stories you reflect on that are put on men. Men should have it all figured out. Men should not be complicated. And men need to prove themselves again and again. I chose to focus Taking Sexy Back on people who've been raised and socialized in the feminine because sex and gender are really entwined. In fact, research shows there's no domain in life 
where gender role expectations are as intense as they are around sex, romance, intimate relationship, that we become the most rigid around gender roles and expectations when it comes to dating, sex, romance, all of that stuff is highly, highly bound to the body you live in, highly bound to as a man you should, as a woman you should. So taking sexy back really is a journey into those who've been socialized around the female story about who you should be as a sexual person. But I'm a couples therapist, a family systems therapist, a systemic thinker. So I know that if you make a change in one part of a system, you shake the system, right? Changing one because we're all connected. So I was thinking about women who are partnered with men or women who have just deep friendships with men and how if she's going through a journey where she's growing her sexual self-awareness, especially if her intimate partner, the person she's having sex with, is a man, it's going to shake the snow globe, right? It's going to sort of like rock the boat a bit. And so I wanted to make sure that her partner was deeply supported around being able to hear about her insights, her ahas, her new awarenesses, and to hear them in a way that really invited him into that journey with her versus making him feel, creating a situation where he feels defensive, inadequate, shamed, blamed, et cetera. So the chapter you're talking about is sort of an open letter I wrote to men who love women who are taking their sexy back. And so we, we unpack these three stories, right? This idea that men shouldn't be confused. And it goes back to like that old story about like men shouldn't have to, men don't ask for directions, which now that we have Siri, it's sort of a <laughs> moot point. But that idea, you know, it's sort of a stereotype that men never ask for directions, but it fits with this larger idea that men ought to have it all figured out. They should have it all figured out. And if they're confused, it's kind of like unmanly, kind of weak to be confused, to have questions. And when it comes to sex, that's a really pretty dangerous notion to bring into the bedroom right? To act as if, to believe, to feel pressured that you have to come into the bedroom and, know, and be able to take charge of the situation. And then the second story is about that men shouldn't be complicated. I'm a parent of teens and I remember, I think it still happens now where, you know, parents would be like, "Ugh, boys are so much simpler than girls. And I think, mm, no, but we sure do teach boys how to wear a mask of simplicity and how to, we, we train our boys to act as if their emotional worlds are pretty simple. But I don't think that's really who boys are. But I think that's another story that then keeps men from feeling even authorized to self-reflect, to say, well, I'm a little bit like this, but I'm also like this, and I don't really have it all figured out. Those two stories really cut men off from feeling like they can engage in a journey of figuring out who they are, especially around sex. And then the third one is my friend uh, Esther Perel talks about, you know, how there's, we have this word emasculated, right? That men get emasculated, but we don't have a, there's no parallel word in the feminine. Like there's no effeminated. I don't think women worry in the same way about sort of not being woman enough. It's not the same kind of thing where with men, you know, you can lose your man card. You know, this idea that masculinity is performative and you're only as good as your last masculine act. And so I think a lot of times men feel like they take that into the bedroom and their performance in the bedroom, which is another just loaded word, their performance in the bedroom reflects and proves their masculinity. Well, that's going to sink a couple like a stone. Like you're talking about your, your clients where he had, you know, quote unquote, premature ejaculation. So I imagine that experience was somehow if he was man enough, this wouldn't happen, right? It was somehow an affront to his sense of worth as a man. That's a panicky moment. And the erotic and panic don't go well together. Bring it back to the feminine. I think it'd be good to tell that really fun fact about the clitoris, that it has 80,000 nerve endings. I, gosh, we really are just pleasure beings, you know? It's very exciting. It's very exciting. It's kind of crazy that women have had clitora, is it clitori, clitorises? <laughs> I have to look and see what the plural is. Women have had a clitoris throughout history, thousands and thousands of years, but it's only in the last 20 years that we've actually imaged, that um, researchers, physicians have actually imaged the full anatomy of the clitoris. That's ridiculous. And it makes you think, what's going on here? You know, we don't, we don't get answers to questions that we are not interested or not willing 
to ask, but we started to ask questions about the clitoris. And yeah, what you find out is it's pretty amazing. It's this organ whose sole purpose is pleasure. And so what would happen if women really felt connected to that deep truth that their bodies are wired for pleasure and have tremendous potential for pleasure? Um, and, and what if women had permission to create erotic experiences that were based around capitalizing on pleasure? Because one of the problems, of course, is if we hold up sexual intercourse as the true sex or the best sex or the only sex that really counts, that's not particularly, the research shows that's not the particularly most pleasure producing, orgasm producing kind of sex for women, just based purely on the anatomy that women are much more likely to have an orgasm from other kinds of sexual experiences, oral sex or using hand, fingers and hands and um, other, that, that just that that's not, that act isn't the most orgasm producing one. What do you think would happen if we are a more pleasure-based society, if women actually recognize that we were just walking around with the possibility of experiencing greater pleasure? Oh my gosh, it's amazing. I, I love the idea then of what it does. I wonder if for women who are partnered with men, if maybe the male partners wouldn't feel so pressured to perform in one particular way. They would feel less pressured if women were able to really express fully in the bedroom. It may help. You know, I think there's a line that goes from like sort of how we express and advocate outside the bedroom and it fits with how we advocate within the bedroom. So I think it would, we're working towards rebalancing power structures in general, but um, not so much in the bedroom. There's not quite the same kind of intimate justice in the bedroom. And I think that would, if, if there was more, then maybe it would be not so hard to have justice elsewhere. Mm, interesting. I never heard of the term intimate justice. Could you speak on that? Intimate justice, Dr. Sarah McClelland at University of Michigan, this is her, her term that she uses to describe to what degree do you feel authorized and entitled to pleasure? What are the grounds on which you evaluate a sexual experience? And what she found in her research is the more marginalized identities you occupy, women, women of color, LGBT communities, the less entitled to pleasure you feel because the world has told you, right? The world has sort of given you the message that you are less than and therefore your pleasure is less worthy. So what she found in her research is that those who occupy marginalized identities tend to have a very much lower bar on what counts as good sex versus those who've had more privileged identities. The bar is higher for what counts as good sex. So a woman described to me when I was, I had lots of conversations as I was writing this book, a woman described to me when she first started being sexual, what counted to her as good sex was it didn't hurt and he snuggled with her afterwards. And it wasn't until she started to read and kind of reclaim her right to sex education and information and conversation with her female friends over brunch where all good conversation happens, <laughs> that she even started to imagine a higher bar of pleasure, of orgasm, of deep, deep, deep concern for her experience. And so then her, her previous sort of ceiling, you know, became her new floor. That's intimate justice. Right. But that was it's so it just is heartbreaking to me that she had a chapter in her life where good sex equaled no pain and being held afterwards. Like that's a very, very, very low bar. So I think we all should be really troubled by that. That nobody should enter sexual experience or adulthood or adolescence with that kind of notion that that's really the most you can hope for is to not be hurt and to have somebody who checks in on you after. It's a very low bar. I thousand percent agree. Okay, I feel like we can't end right there. Can we? <laughs> I know, I just took us down. But what it shows us is the possibility, right? Yeah. Because her story was one of like, holy shit, there's so much more. And then she was like, I'm never going back to those days. Like, I will not enter a sexual space unless my partner is ready to really create something that is based on my clitoris, based on my desire. But she had to claim it for herself. And now she knows to expect it from a partner. Yeah, that's so great. And it does, does also just seem like we really need to self-reflect. And I think that's what's so great too about your book is you actually have contemplation. So it's so hard to know where to begin. Like how do we even begin to understand our sexual history, our lineage, our culture? Uh, well, it's such an honor to have you. I'm just deeply grateful for you being in the world and your work right now is so needed. 
So thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me on. It was a great, great conversation.